This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome each and every one of you to Georgetown Presbyterian Church on this Sunday morning. We are thankful for your presence here this day. This is a day that we will be celebrating all saints as we honor and remember those who have walked before us in this place and light a candle in honor of each of them. Thankful for all of you who are here for that occasion, that important recognition, and those of you who may be visitors with us today and would invite all of you to uh, those seated toward the center aisle to begin to pass down your pew and back up again the ritual of friendship pad and would ask all of you to please sign it. It's a way for us to keep attendance and for those who are visitors, we invite you to give us some information about how we can be in touch with you in the days ahead, uh, whether that be an email address or a phone number or a street address or some combination of those things. We would love to be in touch with you and we are delighted that you are here with us on this morning. A couple of things, uh, several things actually to uh, announce on this day. Uh, a couple of mission concerns that are before us. We are beginning to receive Helping Hands food items. You will, uh, if you would like to be a part of that, receive a bag on your way out today. Some of our children will be giving out uh, grocery bags that will help you to uh, facilitate your ability to uh, collect those items. Uh, going to Helping Hands ministry and helping hungry people here in our community to observe uh, a good Thanksgiving holiday. Also, the deadline for uh, shoe boxes is two weeks away on November the 14th. I know they are already beginning to come in, but uh, be mindful of that. Operation Christmas Child is a way that we reach out to children uh, on, uh, in other parts of the world, helping to make Christmas a possibility for them. Uh, Kay Thomas spoke to that uh, very eloquently last week and made that plea to you, and most of you know of that project, so would encourage you to be a part of that if you're so led to do so. A couple of other announcements there on, um, uh, on your, uh, in your bulletin on the back page. Uh, next week will be uh, the, the, the time that we begin to formally receive pledges of support for the work of the church in the year ahead. We'll have an opportunity toward the conclusion of the service next week for you to come forward to place your pledge in a basket uh, that will uh, be uh, tabulated along with the other pledges that are made to help us to establish the budget for the year 2022. Uh, there are packets available to you if you have not picked it up yet. Would want to remind all of you there are packets out in the narthex and would encourage you to, to, take that, uh, to pick that up and to take that with you as you leave today. They should be in alphabetical order uh, for your convenience and it will help us to save on postage if you can take one with you. If not, we will mail it to you, but to, would encourage you to take that with you as you leave the sanctuary on this day. Uh, just a, a general reminder next week to set your clocks back. It says here that daylight sa savings time begins on Sunday. I think it actually ends uh, on Sunday rather than begins, but uh, it is to, a time to fall back. So just a reminder next Saturday night to set your clocks back uh, an hour or else you're going to be here bright and early, uh, which is fine too. We'll be open and glad to receive you. Um, there are today we uh, do not uh, have the text of the scriptures in uh, your bulletin so you will be invited to uh, find the pew bible in front of you in the pew rack and the page number that is uh, corresponding to that and to follow along with the, the scripture readings if that is something that you desire to do i want to th also say a word of thanks to all of those people uh, who were a part of the fall festival on thursday night it was a wonderful occasion. I don't know about you, Marcy, but I was very pleasantly surprised by uh, the attendance. We had a lot of people here, and the kids had a lot of fun. I think the adults had a lot of fun, too. It was a great event uh, on a rainy night. We were blessed with our gymnasium to be able to host uh, a truly wonderful event for people, uh, kids in this church, but many in our preschool and many in our community as well. So it was a great night, and thanks to all of you who volunteered, all of you who brought candy. Uh, and made that event a possibility. So thanks, uh, one and all, for, for your help in that event, that happy event. Other uh, uh, things coming down the track here uh, for this week and the calendar of events in the week ahead. Uh, Theology on Tap will meet at Indigo Bakery on, uh, on the November the 11th. That is also listed in your bulletin. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure at this time to recognize Emmy Sawyer to come forward to uh, share with you a word of appeal uh, regarding our nursery ministry. So Emmy, I will recognize you at this time. She's bringing a prop. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning.
morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Little Sam and I have some great news this morning. Not only, not only are all the children stuffed with Halloween candy this morning. She can come up here. She can come up here. Yeah. But the, num <laughs> but the number of children here at GPC is starting to grow. Hallelujah. <laughs> I have personally enjoyed the comments many of you have made about the happiness it brings you to see all the children back in church. I couldn't agree with you more. I'm asking all of you to take a minute to look up at our stained glass right behind me as I read Matthew 19, 13 through 14. People brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and to pray for them. But the disciples did rebuke them. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. As members of this church family, we play an important role in the future of the life of this church. And you are looking at the future right here and these little ones. I'm calling all who are able to join me in signing up to volunteer to serve in the nursery. It is a chance to make a direct impact on the future of our church. When we provide a safe and loving environment for our children and their parents, we're showing the care that Jesus calls us to do, pictured here in our stained glass window. I, want, I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you that are already giving your time in this way, the nursery, Sunday school, and Children's Church, we would not be here without them. It truly takes a village. Thank you so much. As I mentioned in a few moments ago, this is the stewardship season, and uh, beginning next Sunday, we will formally receive pledges of support for the work of the church. I would like to, at this time, invite forward David Van Hoos that he might share with you a moment for stewardship from his own personal experience and walk with God. David. Thank you. I think our church's future is in very good shape. Hopefully that's loud enough. Good morning, everybody. When I was a child, televisions were just coming out. It's amazing changes in time. We went to my uh, uncle's house and they had a television. My sis two sisters and I, when we got home, asked my parents if we could be please buy one. And they said, no, not at this time. The church that we were going to in Ohio had a need to replace the heating system. My parents didn't seem burdened by that fact, but rather seemed proud that they were in a position to be able to do that. I have seen that spirit of giving and willingness in many people since I've become an adult, Don and Flo Mabe, certainly, and many of you here today also. The scriptures certainly tell us that we need to support the church. In Exodus uh, chapter 35, uh, verses 4 and 5, Moses tells the Israelites that God commanded that they take an offering to the Lord. In the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and it is clear in the text that it is our responsibility to support the church. Our church, in my opinion, is a great church. I was sitting in a room with my friend who was in hospice care. The minister comes in and the feeling of peace and calm could not have been generated in any other person, by any other person. I come to Sunday church and I go home with an uplifted spirit. Our church supports missionaries spreading the gospel has a great youth program, supports working families by having a child care program, 
supports local nonprofits and encourages us to do likewise in compliance with the scriptures and many other things, Sunday school, women's circle, men's breakfast, many other issues. In my opinion, our church has a significant impact, positive impact on our community and certainly on the lives of Charlotte and I. I am really proud to be a member of this church and of your congregation. I realize that that brings a degree of responsibility on my part. First, to live a Christian life. Second, to follow the way I was up, brought up and the scriptures and support the church financially. The church has been through a very difficult time in the last 18 months, a time that had we been told that it was coming would not have believed. We could not have church. People who would visit and join our church didn't have the opportunity to do that. So it's been economic headwinds. You couldn't pass the offering plate. However, our church has had a rich history of financial support from the congregation. I believe that the conclusion of the current drive, that that obligation, the headwinds will be met and that obligation will again be positive uh, for the church. Thank you very much, may God bless. Thank you, David. Well, also, I neglected to thank Sarah Beth for filling in today in Mary Lou's absence. We are, as always, delighted to have you as our accompanist on this day. Let us call ourselves now to worship. Fling wide the temple gates. Open up the ancient doors. The mighty and glorious one is coming. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in God. Let us now turn to God in prayer. O oh Lord, this church has been a place of worship for many years, many proud and glorious years. We pray that you would instill within us a sense of acknowledgement for the accomplishments of our ancestors and for all of those saints who came before us here, have us to follow the examples of mission and ministry that others have set for us, and yet dare us to envision the future, knowing that decisions made now will impact the days that are yet to come. Have us to live in such a way that one day you may call us loyal and faithful servants. We lift this prayer to you, in that most loyal and faithful name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us as disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
If we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Knowing this, let us confess our sins together first in a time of unison prayer and then in a moment of silent confession. Please join with me. Almighty Lord and God, in Jesus Christ you came from heaven to dwell among us, calling us to be your faithful people. Yet we remain shrouded in sin. We abuse and destroy one another and dishonor your holy name. Forgive us, unbind us, and let us go so that we may stand among your saints and rejoice in your saving grace. These things we pray through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Listen, the one who is seated on the throne says, See, I am making all things new, and now it is finished. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite the children to come up and join me. <laughs> come on. No, okay. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <sighs> Did you have a lot of candy? Yeah. That's why it's so loud this morning, isn't it? <laughs> that's why it's so You're right, Henry. It is so crazy. But I'm going to tell you about something that's even crazier. Are you ready? Okay. What do you see here? It is a pumpkin. It's not a jack o' lantern, it's a pumpkin. That's right. What makes it a jack-o'-lantern? It has a face carved out. Very good. Very good. Pumpkin? Okay. Well, did you know that there's something very special about a pumpkin? I know you've probably carved all your pumpkins, but you're going to do one of these in just a few minutes when we go to children's church. But I want to tell you first about a pumpkin and how special you can make it with all the other pumpkins you've done. Okay? We have to have an open mind, so think about when you open and you carve the top of the pumpkin, and then you have to get all the what out? All the seeds out, that's right, and the guts. That's right, the yucky stuff. Now, can you eat the seeds if you clean them off and put them in the oven? Yes, they're so yummy, they're so good. Okay, so when we take all the seeds and all the guts out, like you said, that can remind us that Jesus died on the cross for us and that he took away all the ugly things and all the guts and all the ugly things for us. He did. He did. He did that for us because he died on the cross for us. 
He did. Jesus died on the cross for us so that we could live forever and ever. So we think about that when we take all the guts out, right? All right. Well, what else is really important to make this a jack-o'-lantern? What do we need? Two eyes. That's exactly right. Okay, well, hold, don't get ahead of me. Hold on one second. So <laughs> we are going to put two eyes on here. In what shape are they? I hope y'all had a great preschool upbringing. So proud. So we open our eyes so that we can see. Is it important for us to be able to see when we share God's love sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. So, and then sometimes do we kind of like turn our nose up at things that we don't necessarily like? Do we kind of go, eh, whatever? Do you do that sometimes? I'm so glad because I have done that sometimes and it really kind of hurt some friends' feelings and it wasn't good. But this reminded me, Roddy, that we are going to place this as a nose. It is a cross. Well, that's his note. And that we can remember that God created a clean heart in us. Okay, so all the guts. God's created a clean heart in us. When we open our ears, do we have to open our ears, Mary Matt? Do we have to open our ears? Yeah, we do. That's right. And so when we open our ears, we're going to put this right here, and it represents an ear, right? And so the scriptures tell, tell us to incline your ear and come to me, which really means your ear, listen, so you can come to me. Miss talking about the stained glass with Jesus and letting the little children come to me. That, this is just another way that you can listen, right? Okay, open my mouth to tell what? Others? Well, we'll work on the other ear, but right now we have a mouth. And what does that mouth look like? It is a fish mouth. Can you say this word, ichthus? Ichthus? Did you know you just spoke a Greek word? Ichthus. Can you say that? Ichthus, that's right. In Ichthus, it says, is a fish, which they would draw in the sand sometimes in Jesus' time, so that um, it was kind of like code to let other people know that they were a Christian and they believed in God. And so when they saw that, they knew that they could speak the word of God to everyone. So when we look at our pumpkin, the top's been cut off, the guts are out, God's created a new heart in us, right? He's given us two eyes and an ear and a nose and a mouth. And all these things can remind us, and we'll work, work on it in children's church, but all these things remind us during this time of year in a fun way what it is to be a Christian, what it means, and how we go about it and how we can remember all that. All right? And the last thing that... This pumpkin, it has a magnet on the back so you can put it on your refrigerator or something. Yeah, looks just like that. It says, let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we let our light shine, right? You all know that the song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's what it's also saying. When you put a light in the pumpkin, you're letting God's light shine forth to everyone, okay? Let's sing Jesus Loves Me as our prayer song. We invite everybody to sing with us too. Are you ready? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so.
And all of God's children said, Amen. Thank you very much. Let's go. Good morning. Let us pray. O oh Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love and strength to follow on the path you have set before us. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Our first scripture reading is from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, death will be no more, mourning and crying and pain will be no more and for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we gather by the river Where bright angels' feet have trod With its crystal tide forever Flowing by the throne of God. Yes, we'll gather by the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints by the river that flows by the throne of God. So We'll reach the shining river. Soon our pilgrimage will cease. Soon our happy hearts will quiver with a melody of peace. Yes, we'll gather by the river The beautiful, the beautiful river Gather with the saints by the river that flows by the throne of God, that flows by the throne of God. Our 
gospel reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, I mean, I'm sorry, the book of John, uh, chapter 11, verses 32 through 44. Let's listen again for the word of the Lord. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him and to them, unbind him and let him go. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts here be found pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Every year, on All Saints Sunday, I remember this one time in theology class at Divinity School. When I was in Divinity School, I was this model student, or very close to it, I tried. I was always early to class, which means this was well before the days of hurrying to put little socks on these tiny wiggling feet and not knowing where my cell phone is or where my car keys are and making sure the crock pot is set to low before we rush out the door. In divinity school, I thoroughly read all of my assignments. I pored over my essays and research papers. I listened quietly and attentively to the lectures, taking notes on virtually everything the professor said and only spoke in front of the large class if I felt brave enough and if I felt I had something profound enough to share in front of people. So one morning, our theology professor, who was also the dean of the divinity school, strode into class with much dignity and seriousness, as he always did, and he proclaimed, good morning, saints, and I don't know what came over me, but I chuckled a little bit under my breath, or maybe I kind of snorted a bit lightly, and it's because I could think of all sorts of descriptions for my classmates and me, but saints would not have been one of them. You laugh, the professor's voice boomed like the voice of God splitting open the heavens. Thinking back, I believe, and I hope, he had a little smile on his face as he said that, but I couldn't really look at him at that time. I just wanted to shrink down in my seat and hide from my embarrassment. Our professor went on to explain, though, that saints aren't only the heroes of the Bible. They are not only the official saints venerated by the Roman Catholic Church, and they're not only the really, really good people in this life. Saints are all of us. And if my professor had to shock me into hearing that and learning that, I'm really glad he did, because I've never, ever forgotten it. Saints are holy, but saints are also messy. We are saints, you and I. We are part of that great cloud of witnesses the writer of Hebrews describes. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. You know, this life is pretty much like a marathon. If you've 
ever run in a 5K or run as part of sports in school or you only run because someone's chasing you, you know what running feels like. It exerts all sorts of energy and every muscle in our body feels like it's burning and we can feel it. Running can bring out our best and our worst. It's not easy. Life is not easy. Life is a journey of both struggle and triumph, pain and joy. But we take courage in that we don't do it alone. We can look to Jesus who's run this before us, who endured the worst, who arose victorious and is now cheering us on. And there's also that beautiful community of our brothers and sisters in Christ, past, present, and future on this side and on the other side, who are cheering us on too. And they not only cheer us on, they are also like these little sparks or open windows shedding light on this world. They give us a glimpse of the kingdom, the world the way God intends it, so that we can learn to live that way as well and teach others to do the same. Now, when I think of saints on this side, I think of a friend who really does take saints seriously. He is Catholic. He has rosaries and even this cool-looking ring with ten little knobs for saying the correct number of Hail Marys. Even though his faith tradition is different from mine, I know that he is for real. He often texts Zach and me a picture of a glowing blue votive candle from his prayer time at church that morning. That means that he's just been praying earnestly for us, interceding for us as a true saint would. When he prays for us, he says, got you covered. He took care of my family and me during the height of the pandemic last year. His frequent question was, need anything? Soon containers of Clorox wipes or bags of sandwich bread or gallons of milk would appear on our front porch like little miracles. I think of a dear friend who's a retired Presbyterian minister. He's recently gone through cancer treatments, but he's still ministering every day, even in his retirement. He spreads joy with his humor and his gentle wisdom. He reads new books all the time so that he can keep growing and learning from voices different from his own. His hands are always at the ready to do mission in his community, and his feet are always ready to march against injustice. He taught me how to live an actionable faith. He also taught me to tell stories when I preach or teach because Jesus told stories. And stories are how we connect and how lives are transformed. I think of a favorite divinity school professor who showed me how to be still and listen. She sat with me and listened one time when I told her of a painful experience in my life. And then she looked at me, I remember, with her deep, dark eyes and reminded me how God parted the seas and brought the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt into a new promised land, and God would do the same for me. I think of a neighbor from another town we used to live in. She's originally from Bulgaria and is now a professor at a local college. She teaches English, but she's also an artist. In fact, she is just art embodied. Even her clothes from her knee socks to her sundresses and cardigans are these explosion of rainbow colors and fanciful patterns. When she's not grading essays, she's running races with her husband and children, cross-stitching fabric with messages of love and peace, volunteering to care for the vulnerable, or setting up art installations downtown to help people ponder what's important in this life. And when I think of saints on the other side, I think of my granddaddy, that gentle, patient soul from a family of farmers up the road in Lancaster. He knew how to grow tomatoes and okra and roses. He helped me with my math homework and taught me how to drive, bless him. Every morning when he dropped me off at school, he would say, remember who you are and whose you are. As those Celtic Christians of Scotland and Ireland would say, the veil can be very thin between this world and that heavenly next world. Sometimes I think that thin veil does get pulled aside, and I feel Granddaddy right here with me with a message of comfort as I navigate this life. I also think about another friend who was a grumpy but lovable guy. 
He was a highly sought after physician assistant in neurosurgery. He also played the organ and loved to cook everything from gourmet Italian meals to casseroles that his mama taught him when he grew up in Mississippi. He shared those recipes, like our favorite one for chicken and wild rice casserole, with me and my family. While medicine was his vocation, and he was very, very good at it, his other passion was lighting, stage lighting, that is. He taught me that care and attention to detail are important, that the little things do matter. He taught me the power of light and to look for the light, literally and figuratively. The blog that I write is actually a tribute to him. It's called Love, Light, and Little Details. Now these are just some of my great cloud of witnesses. They are flawed yet faithful, broken in places yet beautiful. I know you must have your own saints in your own lives and you've probably been thinking of them as I've listed mine. You may have been especially thinking of our beloved church members who've passed away this year. Betty, Verge, Robbie, Betty, Salters, Kenny, John, and Martha Jo. In just a little while, we will ring a bell and light a candle for each of them. These precious saints and all of our saints across time and space are the ones we remember in worship today. We honor what they've taught us and how they have led the way showing us how to live this life of faith. But y'all, we should be honest with ourselves. There is also a somewhat unspoken, yet understood aspect of All Saints Sunday that we need to face along with all of these warm remembrances. It's that excruciating and mysterious thing known as death. That's where we find ourselves as we encounter the gospel reading for today. We find Jesus with his friends Mary and Martha at the grave of their brother Lazarus. We hear the pain and the many emotions of grief. There's bargaining and wishful thinking. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. There's disbelief and confusion and frustration. Couldn't he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept Lazarus from dying? There's stark realism. If we open the grave at this point, won't it stink? And in the midst of it all, there's Jesus, the Word made flesh who shows us the heart of God. Jesus weeps. He weeps with all of those who are hurting. Here we see our God who is with us, who feels with us, who hurts with us. We also see a God who becomes greatly disturbed. The writer of John's Gospel uses the Greek word imbrimaiomai here. It's often translated into English as Jesus was greatly disturbed or greatly moved or distressed. But these translations don't plumb the depth of what this word really means. Maybe because we as a society get uncomfortable with supposedly negative emotions and we often try to gloss over the difficult things of life. So we opt for more pleasant and appropriate ways to say something. But do you know what imbrimaiomai really means? It means Jesus got angry. But why was Jesus angry? Was he angry at people's lack of faith in his healing abilities? Was he angry at the crowds who would weep with him one minute and betray him the next? No, that's not what this kind of angry is. What if instead Jesus were angry as someone feels angry in the face of an adversary? And what if that adversary is death? Jesus is angry at death. Death, that thing that separates, that hurts, that brings questions we can't fully answer. I've always thought that this passage from today could give false hope, a false hope that Jesus could prevent death or even reverse death if I only had enough faith in him to do it. But now I'm seeing that the real miracles are Jesus's tears, his feeling along with us, and then his anger. The Lutheran pastor, Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber, describes it like this. 
Jesus had real friends who died, and he stood outside the tomb of Lazarus and wept. And then, of course, he raised Lazarus from the grave. As though before Jesus was, before Jesus was to defeat death for good, he just needed to give it a good slap in the face first. Jesus faces down the adversary death and gives it a slap in the face like only he could. And we know and we believe what happens next. Eventually, Jesus goes to the cross. He will face death again, and this time it really is just between him and his adversary. Jesus goes through the depths of pain, suffering, separation, despair, and darkness himself, and he dies. But even death could not keep the power and the grace of God out. Even there, God's love reaches down into the depths and says, Death, you do not have the last word. The power of death is defeated, and Jesus rises again victorious. Now, O oh death, where is your sting? This is the promise of Easter, and it's also the promise of where we are today, All Saints Day. Today, we think of those saints who are with us on this side right now. We remember those saints who have run the race before us and are already on the other side. We worship and proclaim our risen and victorious Lord Jesus, the one who makes all things new, the one who is trustworthy and true, the one who is our Alpha and Omega beginning and end. And we celebrate, too, that each one of us at the same time is a sinner and a saint. We're all a part of this messy, beautiful, powerful story together. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and we are in that great cloud of witnesses. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us run this race, persevering, stumbling, rising, loving, rejoicing together. And let's all remember that it is a good morning, saints. Amen. And now, let us pray together responsively the prayer that is printed in our bulletins as we remember and as we rejoice in this great cloud of witnesses together. Let us pray. God of the ages, we praise you for all your servants who have done justice, loved mercy, and walked humbly with their God, for apostles and martyrs and saints of every time and place who in life and death have witnessed to your truth. We praise you, God, for all your servants who have faithfully served you, witnessed bravely, and died in faith, who still are shining lights in the world. We praise you, O God, for those no longer remembered, who earnestly sought you in darkness, who held fast their faith in trial and served others. We praise you, O God, for those we have known and loved, who by their faithful obedience and steadfast hope have shown the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, and especially for those members of Georgetown Presbyterian Church who have in the year just past finished their race and are now at rest with you. We remember Betty English. Verge Harrington. Robbie Jordan. Betty Kilgore. Salters McClary, Jr. Kenny Mitchum. John Murphy, the third.
Martha Jo Poston. And all other loved ones in our extended community and across all time and space. Amen. And now let us together say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed together. Found in our bulletins, let's stand together and proclaim our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Loving God, in life and in death, we know we belong to you. Cover us with peace and hope as we go out from this place now. May we be witnesses of your grace and love and give us the strength to run this race. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.
out as saints knowing we are surrounded by saints and that we have our Lord Jesus who's gone before us, the author and perfecter of our faith, the beginning and end, the past, present, and future. And as we go, may we know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are with us all, now and always. Amen. <laughs>